What would happen if you were to ask AI to analyze the reasoning presented by the Watchtower organization to explain the concept of new light? Curious to know the answer to that question, I downloaded the ChatGPT app to my cell phone and selected the first six paragraphs in Chapter 5 of the book, God's Kingdom Rules. That chapter is entitled, The King Sheds Light on the Kingdom. It's a computer program with no religious bias, right? No one can accuse it of being apostate in its approach to what is printed in the literature. It should be totally fair and objective in its analysis. But to be completely fair, I thought first to ask it for what positive points it found in the paragraphs. So the question I posed was, what valuable lines of logic, reason, or argumentation can be found in the following paragraphs? Imagine that an experienced guide is leading you on a tour of a wondrous and beautiful city. The city is new to you and to those with you, so you hang on to the guide's every word. At times, you and your fellow tourists wonder excitedly about some of the city's features that you have not yet seen. When you ask your guide about such things, however, he withholds his comments until key moments, often just when a certain sight is coming into view. In time, you grow ever more impressed with his wisdom, for he tells you what you need to know right when you need to know it. True Christians are in a situation similar to that of the tourists. We are eagerly learning about the most wondrous of cities, the city having real foundations, the kingdom of God. Hebrews 11.10 When Jesus was on earth, he personally guided his followers, leading them to a deeper knowledge of that kingdom. Did he answer all their questions and tell them everything about that kingdom at once? No. He said, I still have many things to say to you, but you are not able to bear them now. John 16, 12. As the wisest of guides, Jesus never burdened his disciples with knowledge that they were not prepared to handle. Jesus spoke the words recorded at John 16, 12 on the final night of his earthly life. After his death, how would he continue to teach faithful people about God's kingdom? He assured his apostles, The Spirit of the truth will guide you into all the truth. John 16, 13 We may think of the Holy Spirit as a patient guide. The Spirit is Jesus' means of teaching his followers whatever they need to know about God's kingdom right when they need to know it. Let us consider how Jehovah's Holy Spirit has been guiding sincere Christians into greater knowledge about that kingdom. First, we will consider our understanding of when God's kingdom began to rule. Then we will examine the identity and hopes of the kingdom's rulers and its subjects. Finally, we will see how Christ's followers gained a clearer understanding of what loyalty to the kingdom requires. As we saw in chapter 2 of this book, the Bible students spent decades pointing out that the year 1914 would be significant in fulfilling Bible prophecy. However, at that time they believed that Christ's presence had begun in 1874, that he had begun to rule in heaven in 1878, and that the kingdom would not be fully set up until October 1914. The harvest would extend from 1874 to 1914 and would culminate in the gathering of the anointed to heaven. Do mistaken ideas such as these cast doubt on whether Jesus was guiding those faithful ones by means of Holy Spirit? Not at all. Think again of our opening illustration. Would the premature ideas and eager questions of the tourists cast doubt on the reliability of their guide? Hardly. Similarly, although God's people sometimes try to work out details of Jehovah's purpose before it is time for the Holy Spirit to guide them to such truths, it is clear that Jesus is leading them. Thus, faithful ones prove willing to be corrected and humbly adjust their views. Okay, so those are the six paragraphs I asked the computer program to analyze. And again, I first asked it to highlight the good points. What was the response? Here are four valuable reasoning elements it found. 1. Use of analogical reasoning. Value. Helps explain delayed understanding logically. Limitation. Assumes the guide's governing body's trustworthiness without proving it. 2. 
Appeal to scriptural precedent. Value. Reasonable scriptural defense for gradual revelation. Limitation. Shifts the authority from Jesus to modern leaders without demonstration. 3. Willingness to admit and adjust past errors. Value. Intellectual humility. Acknowledgement of error. Limitation. Downplays impact of serious doctrinal mistakes. 4. Emphasis on humility and correction. Value. Encourages a healthy attitude toward learning and revision. Limitation. Deflects responsibility from leadership to followers. Not bad. But then I asked it to please analyze the paragraphs for any logical fallacies. The program provided four logical fallacies that it found. The core logical flaw in the governing body's reasoning here is a misapplication of analogy and an inconsistency in accountability. Here's a breakdown of what's wrong with the logic in the illustration and explanation. 1. False analogy, tour guide versus religious teacher. The chapter compares Jesus and the governing body's role to that of a knowledgeable tour guide who withholds certain information until the appropriate time. But in the illustration, the guide never gives incorrect information, he simply withholds it. The tourists don't publish maps with wrong directions or distribute flawed information to others. By contrast, the Bible students and governing body did not merely wait quietly for clarification. They actively taught and published specific prophetic claims. For example, Christ's presence beginning in 1874, his enthronement in 1878, the end in 1914, as authoritative truth. Those claims were later abandoned or contradicted, and thus, they were not just premature, but wrong. Therefore, the illustration fails to match the real scenario. The equivalent analogy would be a guide giving false directions to parts of the city, only to later correct himself, something no professional guide would be trusted to do repeatedly. Deflecting Responsibility the governing body frames past doctrinal errors as understandable eagerness rather than misinformation or false prophecy. This minimizes the seriousness of publishing inaccurate timelines and doctrinal claims and demanding obedience to those teachings at the time they were being taught. Instead of acknowledging the institutional responsibility for teaching error, they shift the blame to an imagined group of curious followers. 3. Inconsistent application of standards. They imply that it's reasonable for their organization to make serious doctrinal errors and still be seen as guided by Christ through Holy Spirit. Yet, this standard is not applied to other religious groups, which are judged harshly for doctrinal mistakes or prophetic errors. By their own reasoning elsewhere, for example about false prophets in Deuteronomy 18.20-22, a single failed prediction is disqualifying. Here, however, they excuse multiple prophetic failures over decades. 4. Betting the question. The conclusion, it is clear that Jesus is leading them, is presented without actual proof. It's asserted, not demonstrated. The reader is asked to accept the very point in question, that Jesus is guiding the organization as the basis for forgiving their doctrinal failures. That's circular logic. In summary, the logic breaks down because the analogy misrepresents the nature of the governing body's past errors. Responsibility is deflected from leadership to follower enthusiasm. The standard of accountability applied to others is not applied to themselves, and the conclusion that Jesus is guiding them is assumed without evidence. The result is a self-validating loop. We were wrong in the past, but that proves we are right today, because being wrong shows we're humble and guided by Jesus. That's not logical reasoning. That's a narrative constructed to shield the organization from scrutiny while preserving unquestioning trust. Wow, I think I might find myself making frequent use of chat GPT when analyzing Watchtower articles in the future. It comes down to this, friends. Do I really believe that Jehovah is directing this organization today? 